Welcome back to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle. This week's guest is criminal defense attorney Jean Humbrick. Jean and I sat down to talk about her new book, More Than a Fine. But what was really exciting is, of course, I had to dive in why she became a lawyer. And what was really interesting is she has the defense spin on it. And I think, um, as I mentioned in the podcast, so you'll hear me say this again, nowadays, you know, everyone loves the crime documentaries and whatnot. And I think though so many of us come from the other perspective. And so I thought it was really interesting how she kind of got to being passionate about being a defense attorney. And so we talk about that. We also talk about, I had some thoughts about that. Wow. A defense attorney actually, at least her, can be mindful and empathetic, things you might not think about um, a defense attorney being. And so that was really fun. And we finish up with talking about kind of what it actually looks like if stuff really hits the fan in your life and you do need to reach out to a lawyer. Because as you guys know, it's all about peeling back the layers here. And um, if we can build up that resiliency before we need it, thank you, Susan McCorkendale, for that then let's do it. And so God forbid, I hope none of you ever get in trouble. But if you do, Jean can give us a pep talk before we're hopefully ever in a position like that. So join us as we flush it out. Coming to you from the M&M Exterior Studio in Nooksville, Virginia, This is Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle, the introvert's extrovert. She talks to people so you don't have to. For now. Welcome back to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle. Um, My guest today is Jean Humbrecht. She's a criminal defense lawyer and... um, I'm excited to chat with Jean today. She actually authored a new book. So Jean, why don't you um, tell us a little bit about yourself and about your book? Well, as Samantha said, my name is Jean Humbrecht. I have my own law practice located in Manassas, Virginia, Humbrecht Law. I do criminal and traffic defense exclusively. And I just wrote a new book called More Than a Fine, The True Cost of Speeding in Virginia. And in the book, I talk about all the different ways that speeding ticket convictions can affect your life. As the book says, it's more than just a fine. Um, With that fine come court costs. DMV points. If you get too many DMV points, your license could be suspended. A security clearance can be in jeopardy. Your car insurance is going to go up. It can affect your life insurance. There are a number of different ways that speeding convictions can affect your life. And um, look for my new book on Amazon because it will talk about all of those different ways. That is a little overwhelming if I'm being honest. (laughs) You know, you just think like, oh, it's just a speeding ticket. I was thinking in my head, Jean, would this be a good book for parents to give their teenage drivers? Absolutely. And make them read it because (laughs) juveniles are actually impacted differently than adults. If they just get one ticket that results in points, they're convicted of a ticket, I should say, resulting in points, they are required to take a driver improvement class. If they don't take it, and parents have to go with them. And if they don't take the class within 90 days, I think, then their license is suspended. And it's suspended until they take the class. And if they get two tickets resulting in points, they, their license is going to be suspended. So kind of has some serious stuff that I would not have thought about. And a lot has changed probably in the last however many years it's been since I got my license. So good to know. Good to know. Um, now, Jean, you are, I believe, the third lawyer on the show. So congratulations, lucky number three. We've talked to uh, Matt Jennings, who's part of M&M Exteriors, our, our um, sponsor, and we joke he's a, is it a recovering lawyer? Is that, is that what they call himself? Um, and so he changed professions. Then we have Brad McConnell, who spoke. He's a business lawyer. And it was actually through the conversations with both of them. You know, I think whenever anyone hears, I'm a lawyer, they want to ask you all the legal questions. And both of them had said, nope, this is my, this is my field. And so for Brad, it's business law, which is very helpful for lots of business owners. And then for you with the criminal defense and traffic, people probably want to ask you the business tax, all that stuff questions, but you're finally the lawyer where it's like, I have a ticket. Can you help me out with that? Is that like, that's your niche, right? That is my niche, traffic and criminal and, and nothing else. I can refer you to anybody, but But, people come to me and say, oh, I have a bankruptcy issue or, you know, this person didn't do this, this contract, didn't follow through with this contract on my house and what can I do? And, 
I'm like, well, you really need to talk to an attorney who specializes in that. Oh, well, it's just a simple question. No, no, no. Nope, nope it's not. <laughs> you need to works. talk to somebody who specializes in it because I am not, you know, the person to ask. If it's criminal and traffic, I got you. But anything else, you know, go to Brad for contracts. Go not, to- not your field. Now, I love chatting with lawyers because obviously here at Fleshing It Out, it's all about kind of peeling back the layers and kind of going through those common life experiences and taking out those nuggets of wisdom. And what I love about lawyers is I think that there's just a different way of thinking. Brad, uh, Matt talked about the Socratic method mm-hmm. and how, you know, and to, to, for if any listeners are not aware, you know, it's the whole kind of you, you can clarify me on this, but it's like teaching yourself. You read and pull out stuff. So the teachers at the law school don't actually teach as much. You have to learn it on your own mm-hmm. and then you go and talk about it. And it takes a different type of thought process. And so, that was interesting to me. And so I was talking with you before we recorded about kind of, you know, what made you want to be a lawyer? Because I think that, you know, people watch Law and Order and they're like, well, I want to go do that. And then when you actually get into it, for example, the Socratic method, you know, being taught like that, that just takes a whole other, I think, part of your brain. Mm -hmm. So what kind of got you into wanting not only to be a lawyer, but then specifically the criminal and defense stuff? I wanted to be a lawyer for as long as I can remember, being five years old. And I don't know how that started. Uh, I, nobody in my family is a lawyer. I just always wanted to be a lawyer, always wanted to do crimi- or criminal law, um, but not criminal defense specifically until I was in college, but always wanted to be a lawyer. My mom said it was because I like to argue. I disagree, of course. Of course, um, <laughs> but that's right on par, so that, that worked out well. <laughs> Um, I like public speaking. I like I like being active. I don't like sitting behind a desk all day, you know, and, and doing criminal law. You're in court every day, and it's always something different. And um, it just you always have to be prepared for something new. So, you know, that I didn't really learn until I started doing it. But just those those kind of things, I I just really liked about it. And specifically, criminal defense. When I was in college, I think it was my sophomore year. I was taking a class on criminal law. And I had to write a paper. I don't even remember what the required topic was. But I ended up writing a paper on the pretrial publicity in the Scott Peterson case. At the time, it seemed to me like he was being judged, as you would say, in the court of public opinion. I would hear these things on the news. That, and I thought, you know, one, why are they even saying that on the news? Two, they shouldn't be releasing evidence. Three, you're tainting the jury pool. I was just thinking, you know, he's not going to get a fair trial. Because, I mean, that occurred in California, and I was a high schooler here in Virginia, and even I knew about it, you know. And and to just wrap up, if people's brains are spinning to kind of loop them in, the Scott Peterson case is his wife was eight months pregnant or so, right? Yeah, eight or nine. Yeah, she was was very pregnant. I think she was eight or nine months pregnant, yeah. And she was missing, and he was doing the reports, you know, about looking for his wife, and it turned out he had had a girlfriend who he was lying to, well, uh, allegedly, I don't know where they're at, we're at with the facts, Um, (laughs) but was tragically, you know, they tragically found her, and so I feel like that was one of the first, not first, I mean, there's always been these news stories, but definitely that was when that 20, when we had the cable news, the 24 hour media. And so not only was it being reported on, that's, I think when there were so many shows that commented on it as it was unfolding that Mm -hmm. I feel like for me, at least in my memory, that's one of my first early memories of something really tragic and shocking that kind of took over the media just to let everyone in. If you don't remember, if you didn't remember that case, just so much stuff that, you know, probably that, that shouldn't have been in the news that just really, Um, stuck with me. And I was, how old was I, 19 or 20 at the time? That was before I was even in law school. And I just, um, you know, regardless of whether or not I I thought he was guilty, I just, I thought, you know, the whole purpose is to have a fair trial. Mm -hmm. And having all that stuff in the news media, I mean, to this day, I still think about it when people ask me when I knew I wanted to be a defense attorney, that's, Mm -hmm. that's really when. It's not, you know, to to get people off of something that they did. It's to ensure that they have those rights that are guaranteed to us, right to a free trial, or um, a fair trial, I should say, and and free from all of this um, pretrial publicity. Mm-hmm. I liked, um, I thought that was an interesting point, you know, when we were just casually talking about what got, before we recorded about what got you into law, practicing law, because nowadays we, um, podca- the number one podcast 
topic is true crime. Mm -hmm. And there's, it's, you look at the Netflix documentaries and everything. I just feel like people are obsessed with crime documentaries. And I think that we as humans have like an innate desire to judge, you know, we want to know, we want to pass judgment. We don't want people to pass judgment on us. You know, we want a fair trial if, um, but we want, you know, but we want to give that to other people. So I was intrigued by, you know, what is it about you that had you actually lean into this isn't right, you know, and this needs to be more fair versus kind of the mob mentality of like crucify him, you know, like Mm -hmm. obviously he's wrong. And so do you think like some of that, maybe like unfair judgment, you know, kind of having that passionate passion to help people, I guess, fight the good fight. Do you think that is? It, that probably was what it was deep down. And I didn't really realize it. I mean, you know, you know what your constitutional rights are, but you don't really think about them. And yeah, that was somebody that I didn't know. I have no personal connection with, and I still just, just inherently thought it was just unfair. I mean, if you're going to have a fair trial and, you know, a jury of your peers is going to convict you based on what's presented to them in court, that's the way the system is supposed to work. Mm -hmm. You know, hundreds of years ago, even 50 years ago, we didn't have the media that we have today. I mean, only very recently did they even start televising these trials. Mm -hmm. So people didn't have access to all of it. Now that I think about it, I think that was the year that I joined Facebook. That was around the time that, you know, MySpace had existed I have an old MySpace account that exists somewhere and I don't know how to delete it. <laughs> we, I'm sure many, many of us if you, uh, <laughs> are in that generation of the crossover, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But that just occurred to me. I, th- I think it was my sophomore year of college. Um, that would have been in, oh, well, around that time. That's when I first got on Facebook. So, and then Facebook has exploded from, from what it was back then. So, so yeah, I mean, what you said earlier about the, you know, the 24 hour news media, And then it's just gotten worse since then. So maybe that's why it stood out to me so much because that was the first time that we were actually seeing it so much. But you know, it's funny now that we talk about it. I actually remember being in third or fifth grade somewhere back there when the OJ Simpson trial was going on. And I even knew about that. I mean, you know, when I was in school and they released the verdict, I don't know how, but as a fifth grader, I heard what the verdict was. And then my mom picked me up from school and we were talking about it. So, but I think that was the first case that was ever televised and that was huge. But I mean, how many years between the two? I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years, something like that. But those are the two cases I remember. I don't remember hearing anything in between. I mean, there yeah. were, but you know, with the, the media coverage, those, those yeah. are the ones that really stick out. And I was a child. <laughs> yeah. But that, that did take over too. Cause I remember teachers were watching it, you know, they were probably they weren't allowed to maybe watch it unless it tied into their class or something, but that Mm -hmm. definitely took over. What are your thoughts on, um, I have two thoughts that I'm having. Okay. Part of me is like, okay, I have this opportunity to talk to a real life criminal defense lawyer. I think of college, which law and order put me to bed every night. And I know I'm not alone with the law and order obsession and whatnot. So my first question would be, it ties into this whole right and wrong thing. And so there's this idea, like I said, when people heard the Scott Peterson case, you just, you, I feel like just, like I said, we have this innate desire to judge. We want justice. You know, it's that you, the, from based on the facts you hear, I just think most people, you know, you think, okay, he's guilty. And you just want to see him um, in a quote, quote, like pay and Mm -hmm. get justice. Your brain went to a fair trial. Mm -hmm. which is equally justice, you know, because you don't want to have an innocent person go to jail. That's just as passionate. And I feel like now in today's, we talked about the 24 news cycle. We talked about Facebook. I think the biggest change with the social media is that everybody's personal opinion is out there. And so often people are like butting heads with what they believe, but we forget sometimes that so often at the core of it, we're all coming from the same place. We want justice. We want fair justice though. And so with you, how does it work? I guess it's like, like you said, you don't know whether he's guilty or not. And so if you defend someone, I guess like, I don't know if I can, if you can answer this, but it's the whole, like, what if they are guilty? Like, how does that work? 
or if you think they're guilty, do you excuse yourself? Like, what does that actually look like? So what you need to do, it, your job is to protect their rights. So whether or not they are guilty, your job, back to what we were saying, is to make sure there's a fair trial. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to a jury trial, that jury should only know what legally is, is allowed to be in front of them. The evidence that should be included based on the law should come in. The evidence that should not come in should not come in. And then based on the, uh, the decision of 12 of your peers after being instructed by the court, they make the decision. And your job as the defense attorney is to make sure that your client's rights are being protected, all of their rights. It's kind of, it reminds me of listening to that. It reminds me of being in school. And I remember being asked, um, I'm sure it was in like a history or some type of uh, social studies class, should certain groups be allowed to march in parades? And I think the example used at the time was like the KKK. And, you know, being younger, that just was like, well, no, obviously not. It's a hate group, to my beliefs, hate group. No, it should not be allowed to march. Duh. That was a no brainer. And I remember the teacher saying, well, because we're in America and the way freedom of speech works and whatnot, that if you like, you know, legally allowing them because to legally allow others. And I just remember my mind being blown. Like that was one of those monumental things that it did not make sense. Like what they're, what I believe what they're doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. But how do you um, allow this? So I just remember, I could feel like that was part of my, my personal process of the layers starting to get peeled back of like, uh, this is not black and white. And so um, back to law and with what you do, you know, you have, like I said, we have this obsession with true crime. And I think it's fascinating to get to peel back the layers because everyone wants to like I said, serve the justice. And so what are your thoughts on like the true crime podcast and everyone wanting to weigh in on all of this stuff? Because like I said, you go back to, I need to protect the rights because I feel like that goes back to the whole freedom of speech thing where it's like, mm-hmm. if we get too caught up in like vigilante justice, mm-hmm. forget about the innocent people that could, that get caught up with that. So I don't know if that all makes sense, but kind of just tying into this whole true kind culture. Like, what are your thoughts on all that? I'm into it too. I mean, I watch these documentaries on Netflix and I think they're fascinating. I, I mean, I, I, and I've got my own opinion. Some are better than others. My husband eventually gets tired of it because every, I'm like, oh, let's watch another murder mystery. <laughs> um, but it's interesting to me to see the different perspectives. Um, and like I said, some I agree with and, and some I don't, but it's, it's still interesting to see, you know, what happened in this case. And sometimes they're not, you know, they, they show very little, um, very little compared to what actually went on. Um, but, but then again, like that's just my analytical mind looking at it and saying, why didn't they talk about this? And they should have talked more about that. And they shouldn't have talked about that at all. But I even am intrigued by them. So, um, yeah, and I don't, um, I don't know what it is. I don't know how that started. I don't know if it started because of some of these, these trials that got so much media attention. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, yeah, I know true crime pro- uh, podcasts are the, the, the biggest proportion of podcasts that are, that are out there. I don't actually listen to too many of those, but I do watch the documentaries yeah. on TV. Um, do you have any thoughts that you'd be willing to share about any of the popular documentaries that are out about any takeaways? Is there any common themes or opinions that make you want to raise your fist. I know I brought up to you, can't remember if Matt's conversation, if it made it to air, but we talked about in this, I think there was actually a documentary on it. The, um, the McDonald's hot coffee incident. Like that was one of those things I just brought up nonchalantly. And all of a sudden it was like, there was a lot of passion behind it. So is there anything that kind of brings up that passion for you that you feel comfortable talking about? Well, first of all, that case infuriates me. See, there's another another one. (laughs) Why? For a of and that's not even what I do. I can't claim to be an expert on it. I don't know all the details about that particular case. But for me, I just i i thought that I thought that the jury. So so what happened is the jury awarded an amount of money, and then the judge later came back and reduced that amount. They um they awarded an amount that I thought was was just too high. Again, and and. This actually kind of goes to your question, right? Because I don't know all the details in the case. All I know is what I saw in the media. But yeah. from, from what I saw, that 
that person, you know, was not completely innocent and did something that they, they shouldn't have been doing. Right. So, I mean, coffee, coffee is supposed to be hot. That's just, you know, and you got to be careful with it. And so, but that, that's all I'll say about that. Um, so but in terms of, in terms of takeaway for, I don't know if Matt had the same opinion. I, I He did not because what he was saying, gosh, I can't remember if this was on air and I feel like I'd want to check before, but it was like the coffee was hotter than it should have been and that McDonald's knew about it because to keep it, you know, uh, I forget, there was a reason behind it, but that they knew it was hotter than it should be. And, you know, there were some other reasons that weren't in the media and things like that. And so I just okay. thought that was fascinating, but it, but it goes back to the whole, like how much information you have depends on what your judgment is. Like, that's actually a perfect example of you kind of look at when there are these documentaries or when the media, what they choose to share versus what they don't. Like, mm-hmm. I just feel like the more you start peeling back these layers, it, I just feel like it points us back as people to how we judge people because we feel vindicated. Like we feel right. We want to feel right, you know, with our judgment. And yeah. yeah. And I think either way that you come down, you know, you could have two, two people watch the exact same documentary and have completely different views on it. Um, so while in some ways it, it's good that, that it's out there for people to see, I mean, but maybe it also just does add fuel to the fire of the court of public opinion and, and, judging people, you know, I don't know. That's, that's an interesting thought. Yeah. Well, like I said, I am a law and order, you know, I was an active law and order. I used to joke. I wanted to go to law school. I as well am pretty love hashing things out. Um, but then I also, I, now that I've had so many lawyer friends, either here on the podcast that I've talked to, I had a friend that just went back to law school. Now I'm like, oh, I think I overestimated my confidence. Like <laughs> the p- confident part of me, like I'm sure I could have done it, but like, wow, that's a lot of work. <laughs> that's a lot of thinking outside the box. With the clients you've worked with, because I know, you know, you are a traffic defense lawyer and whatnot, defending clients and having to look out for their rights. I don't know if you ever thought, but as I was listening to you, I thought picking your brain is interesting because I don't know if mindfulness is something you've ever like that they talk to lawyers about, but you know, mindfulness is kind of like taking away judgment and just experiencing stuff. And I wonder if that is kind of part of what you do with your clients because you kind of remove the judgment and just look at what's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I didn't really think about it that way, but yeah, that's, that's exactly it because every, I mean, everybody makes mistakes, but you don't even, you don't even look at it that way. I mean, like, that's not the way that you look at the case. You look at everything that was going on, like at the time of whatever happened, but also, you know, in their life and, you know, what happened to lead up to this and what are the consequences going to be for this particular person? Because they're all different. Like, like that speeding ticket book that I just mentioned. I mean, you know, somebody that has a security clearance or somebody that's required to drive as part of their job duties is going to be affected a lot differently than somebody else. That doesn't mean, you know, just blow it off, but, you know, be aware of, you know, everybody's individual situation, mindful, like you said. Yeah. I was just thinking like, do you feel like it allows you to be more compassionate towards people in a defense capacity? I think so. And I think that's just something that, that you don't think about, you know, cause I've been doing this for six years and have learned and grown so much in six years. And I still learn every day, but you know, the way that I am now versus six years ago, I'm sure is, is totally different. So I, I think that it does change the way that you, you know, view everything you view other people that you interact with. Um, just, just for example, like you could be out and someone could be rude to you. And even though you take, I mean, you're, you're hurt. I mean, they might say something that's very hurtful, you know, in your mind, as it's going on or right after it's going on, you think, okay, well, what, you know, I got to react appropriately to this. I can't overreact. And then you think, well, maybe they didn't really mean it. Maybe they were having a bad day. Um, you know, you just, you think all of these things. So you're, I guess, maybe trying to give people more of a benefit of the doubt. And like you said, be mindful. And I think that's something that was actually a very good observation because it's something that we don't really think about, I guess, as, as it's going on. But I, I think, you know, doing the job that I do really did have that impact, not just with my particular clients, but with everybody. Well, because you think, I was thinking about with what you do, um, 
And it reminds me of financial planners, accountants, you know, basic uh, doctors. It's the people who we can try to put on a, a face, you know, look at me, I'm professional. I'm a good person. But, you know, if you get into, if you make a mistake, which spoiler alert, we are all capable of making a mistake. And we're all, I mean, like, I remember one time someone said, it was like, we're all one mistake away from ruining, like the life we have right now, you know? And so when you see the people on the news and things like that, how did that happen? It's like, we all could be that person basically. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking you see people's real stuff. Like if someone comes in and they're like, I've been hiding the fact that I've been getting all these tickets, you know, I just didn't care. But now it's almost like the law caught up with me. Mm -hmm. But I, and so I, I related it to finances and things like that, because I've talked to people, you know, um, like an accountant and been like, I have not been, you know, keeping track of stuff the way I should be. And I just feel like I'm failing as a person and they meet me with empathy and compassion because what I, with shame and everything and what we talk a lot here about on fleshing it out, it's like when people start revealing their real stuff, whether it's personal, professional, the best thing we can give people is empathy and compassion. Mm -hmm. And I feel like with, if you are a defense lawyer, you are literally dealing with people that have some serious stuff, or mm -hmm. as I usually say, like, <laughs> you know, another word for that and they're laying their stuff out there. And so I would imagine you've been able to practice that muscle of providing that empathy and compassion because you've seen it, you've seen more stuff and you can actually give that as a gift to your clients that I wouldn't have thought about before we started talking. But like I said, you've practiced that. And so I would imagine you're able to kind of do that for other people too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're right. And that's something that I didn't really think about before we had this conversation. So, so when someone's facing a traffic or criminal charge, um, most people to them, at, it, it is the most, and, and not even to them, it, it is the most important thing going on in their life. And, and they, it's, it's all they think about 24 hours a day because they're, you know, they're, I come at it from a different perspective, obviously they're, they're scared. Uh, they don't know the court process. They don't know what's going to happen. So having somebody that can, you know, walk you through it, I think is very important because me, like, like anybody in their job, you know, you do it every day. And, and, you know, so it's, you have to also be mindful, like you said, that the person that you're interacting with, whether it's a traffic ticket or a serious felony charge, they don't, they don't know what to do. They don't know what the process is. And they're scared that the worst is, is going to happen. And you do have to prepare them for the worst, but at the same time, you know, reassure them and, and help them through the process and help them do what they need to do to best prepare for it. And that's something that definitely comes with time. Yeah. Yeah. So if someone's facing, you know, like I said, they've got this shame because it could be something seemingly trivial, like a ticket they got, mm -hmm. or it could be like you said, some really heavy, big stuff. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of talk? What, what would be kind of the advice you would give someone facing kind of one of those things? Cause no one wants to tell you if someone gets a DUI, for example, mm -hmm. DUI is one of those things where I feel like so much shame and judgment because no one agrees drunk driving is good, like horrible, dangerous could end your life, someone else's life. Like I don't even need to go on. However, the example I'm using in my head is tr um, Tracy Gold. I think she was on Growing Pains. So I'm dating myself. Um, but if people watched that show and I remember it was whatever year it was, it was she was on Oprah because she got pulled over for drunk driving and you know, her picture, her uh, mugshot was in the tabloids and whatnot and just oh, America's sweetheart and drunk driving and, and, mm. and whatnot. So of course everyone's like horrible. Can't believe she did that. I remember be her being on Oprah and watching it. And she was saying that her and her husband and her kids were at a barbecue with friends and they had had some beverages and that she had had less than her husband. And so she drove and hindsight 2020, she shouldn't have driven, but she didn't feel at all drunk and didn't feel unsafe. And it was one of those, she was at that limit. And of course the safe choice is to not drink and drive at all. If you're going to have any beverage, don't drive. I mean, that, those are, that's the, I feel like obvious advice, but people don't always, but that's also not reality. A lot of the times people drink a couple drinks and drive home. And so anyway, my point is that was another one of those aha turning points for me where I remember seeing her 
judging her, even if it was subconsciously, how could she do that? Yada, yada. And then when I heard the whole story and probably because I was a little older too, it was like, Oh, that could be us. And so once again, you know, you hear people where something like that happens, they get in trouble for something DUI, their shame that they did it. So how do you kind of help walk someone through something where, like you said, it's the most important thing in their life or it's the lowest they've felt. Mm -hmm. Do you have any encouragement for that? Well, I would walk them through it in the same way, but like regardless of whatever their charge is, but my particular advice would be different. So I'd tell them, you know, what you're facing, ask, you know, what happened? What are the police going to tell me happened? Because so I mostly practice in Prince William County and in Prince William County, um, all the officers have body cams. Hmm. So whatever happened, I, you know, I tell them now, cause this started in about 2017. So I went through, I went through the time before we had them and to when they just started and it's now when almost everybody has them, at least in this County. Um, so I say, you know, I'm, I'm going to see what happens. So tell, tell me what, what am I going to see on these cameras? So I say, you know, find what happened. And then I give them what I think is a realistic assessment of, you know, can they prove it? Can they not? Um, do we have a good case? Do we not? What type of, you know, offer are we likely to get? What can you live with as a result? You know, what's, what's your job situation? What's your family situation? Can you do any jail time? Because if you're looking at a serious felony, I mean, there's, there's going to be, if you're charged with any crime, you need to be prepared for jail. So I tell people what the consequences are of the particular offense, what I think would be a likely outcome and how to prepare for that, whether that's a speeding ticket or whether it's a serious felony. And there's different ways that you can prepare for it. If it's something that involves, you know, alcohol and drugs, if you're not in treatment, you can go to treatment. If it's a driving related thing, you can take driving classes. I mean, there there are a variety of, of things that you can do before court to get in the best possible position. And, and that best possible position depends on what your particular circumstances are. So it's just, it just depends on what your particular situation is, but the process is the same. Yeah. I'm encouraged by that. And, um, I, the reason I say I'm encouraged by that is because a common theme that I've heard, not related to this, but just with the whole idea of the human condition, sharing our stuff and things like that is that that this isn't the end, whatever you're facing is not the end of the story. Mm -hmm. So someone, when they meet you or or right now, even just listening, because a big part of, I feel like what I want to do for people is provide other people's stories or expertise, knowledge, and things like that. Like for example, with talking to you, because if ever the stuff hits the fan in your life, like if you ever are facing something like this, that it's not the end of the story, that even if it feels so bad, just hearing you talk through like, well, we might be able to do this and we might be able to do this, that there's ways to come out of a situation. And just to, I feel like the more life you see, even if it were to end that job, there could be another job. Like that this is always not the end of the story, that there's always hope, I guess, without even sound, I didn't even mean to sound too Pollyanna, but like, stuff that feels life ending to us sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's just when you talk to someone who deals with this all the time, it's like, oh yeah, this isn't the end of the story. There are other ways to get through it. Mm -hmm. I think that's really helpful. Um, you know, as we are starting to wrap it up and they talk about the legal system and whatnot, that it's, um, people are treated differently in court, you know, that's, so I don't know what, where you would comment on that, but it seems like, you know, to use a common term right now, with things that are not legal. There's the whole cancel culture, which is like, if you do something wrong in the court of public opinion, even just, you know, that people just want to cancel and get rid of you. And I feel like in the, in the legal world, because it goes back to our judgment, the way we judge people, we want right and wrong. We want to be able to, if someone does something wrong to be like, they need to pay. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, there's this kind of, well, what about second chances? What about people learning from their mistakes? You know, not wanting someone's mistake to be life ending for them and their family. Mm -hmm. You know, I know that there's like people treated differently based on their life circumstances, whether race, gender, things like that. Um, what are your thoughts? Just, I mean, like I said, that's like opening up a whole other can of worms, but it seems like, you know, with you wanting to work with clients, it's working with a specific person. So I feel like you probably have a very passionate heart with wanting to treat people fairly. Mm -hmm. 
And that, that's what I think is really intriguing about a defense lawyer. Cause like I said, we all want to like, I think everyone wants to be the prosecutor. You know, <laughs> if you're like playing pretend, you want to be the prosecutor to like get them to pay. Mm -hmm. But I just think as your empathy and compassion grows and you think of people and more of their situations, you really like want to help people. And so I guess that's my point is as I was listening to you, it's that really wanting to look at people as individuals and help them and not, not kind of have, what is it like the um, blanket? Like if you get a, if in trouble for doing this, this is the punishment. Mm -hmm. Like that's too black and white. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. So right. yeah, no, it's definitely not, not black and white at all. Yeah. And, and I see what you're saying. I mean, coming at it from that perspective, I mean, you know, people, people want closure. They want justice. Some, you know, some people want vengeance. They want a person to, to pay for whatever it is that they did. And I think going back to, this is a nice segue to what you said earlier, that everybody wants justice, whatever the just result is. I mean, the whole, the whole point of having the fair trial and, and the justice system is to make sure that everybody is treated fairly. And at the end of the day, the result is, is the fair result, you know, whether that's a jury, um, you know, quitting somebody or a jury, you know, convicting them of what they're charged with or anything in the middle. Mm -hmm. So final question, if someone's listening to this and they get in trouble, should they call you? Absolutely. <laughs> call a defense lawyer before it, you, anybody else. You need to talk to an attorney. So when everyone's like, oh, I know a lawyer, like guys, it's no good. You need to know a defense lawyer. So now that Jean's been on the show, all y'all know a lawyer to call. I will say if you get a traffic ticket or a criminal charge, Go to a traffic or criminal attorney. If you have a, a business issue or an issue with contracts, that's when you call Brad McConnell. Yes. Whatever your particular issue is, you know, if you want a will written, go to a lawyer that does that. Um, and if you have a family friend that's a lawyer, they probably only focus on one particular area. So, you know, feel free to ask them for, you know, recommendations, but you really should get a lawyer that does whatever it is that your particular issue is. But if someone gets a speeding ticket, call Jean. And look for my book. <laughs> awesome. Well, Jean, <laughs> tell everyone, thank you so much for your insight. And I appreciate, I think it's just fascinating. Like I said, I love talking to someone who, whose brain naturally works different. Because like I said, just right away with the Scott Peterson case, just kind of you coming at that different angle. I think that's really neat. Um, but I loved hearing you share because like I said, I think just at the end of it, we're all coming we all want to come at things from a compassionate and empathetic way. It might look different the way it is expressed, mm -hmm. um, but just being reminded that, you know, that it really is all coming from the same place of goodness. And so I appreciate your time and appreciate your insight. Well, thank you for having me. This was a good conversation. Great. Now, how can people find you, especially if they have a speeding ticket here in Northern Virginia? <laughs> you can go to my uh, YouTube page. It's Humbrecht Law on YouTube. You can go to Facebook, Humbrecht Law, Instagram, Manassas Criminal Lawyer. My website is humbrechtlaw.com. Um, should I give my phone number if anybody's going to write it down? Sure. So, you know, 3479-0015. You can basically find me on any social media platform. Um, go to my YouTube page, subscribe, like my videos, share, comment on them. Um, I'm going to be trying to update that regularly with just little tidbits about different areas of the law that people might not think about. So, um, but you find me online and then my book will be on Amazon more than a fine. More than a fine. Well, thank you, Jean, so much for your time. Um, love chatting with you. And like I said, check out her book more than a fine. All right. Thanks. And that's a wrap for now. Thanks for listening to Flushing It Out with Samantha Spittle. Music provided by twinmusicom.org. Song titled Night at the Dance Hall. Sound editing by me, Jeremy Spittle. A special thanks to our studio sponsor, M&M Exteriors. Visit their website at mmexteriors.com for all of your roofing, siding, and gutter needs in the Northern Virginia area. Visit our website at flushingitout.com and be sure to subscribe. This has been a Spitfire production. That was the greatest thing I've ever heard.